I love to go around and shop. And the same as a surprise to me, when back in 2013, Mr. Anderson said, you know what? All the retail industry is going to die. All the stores are going to shut down. And that was in 2013. I've been here for 30 years. And during the 30 years when I first landed, it was a Hooray Center that was the outlet. Every single time Dubai managed to open up a new shopping mall, I would look towards myself and say, hey, who the hell is going to go there? And look at the level where Dubai is today. As a matter of fact, Mr. Anderson was so mistaken because two and a half years, two and a half years later, I came across an article that said the future will likely not be dominated by any one channel. Instead, it is dragged across many touch points led by brands that create well-executed hybrid experiences that drive engagement and sales regardless of tool. This is evidenced by the fact that the likes of Apple, who are at heart digital, have opened up their experiential stores. It's as well rooted in what is happening around the world with all the online traders that have created physical brick and mortar. And as long as any brick and mortar can deliver the experience based on a deep understanding of need, that brick and mortar will survive. Guess what is the source for need that people have? It's intelligence, it's data, it's information that helps inform whatever we do. And because this is a data-driven kind of master class, I thought we'd have a fun game with some figures. So, digital interactions were expected to influence 64 cents of every single dollar spent during 2015. And that would amount to like 2.2 trillion US dollars. Digitally influenced consumers have got that propensity 20% more to buy more. So whoever is digitally informed is willing to spend 20% more than what they have in their pockets. And guess what? Those who are on Facebook and on Twitter and who are all over the social media channels are prone to have four times more the spending power <coughs> as they move into brick and mortar. Luckily, back in 2015, 93% of purchases were done in stores, in brick and mortar. Granted, 70% of those were influenced by the social media space and were influenced by smart shopping online, or I would call it smart free shopping online. The end result is always going down to the store and actually touching and feeling the product before buying it. We're expected by 2020 to have 50 billion connected devices around the world. Yes, 50 billion of these, which act as small pieces of glass that are connected to our hands and our lives sit on it. This made us believe that the shopper and the psyche of the shopper has changed. We no more can as brands dictate what we want to do and how we do it because the shoppers live in what we call the me-commerce world. So it's no more about M-commerce or E-commerce or brick and mortar commerce. It's my commerce, me commerce as a shopper. So I'm in control and I'm in command. And in order to understand how this shopper can behave and how you can influence the behavior of these people, you would need big data. You would need a deep understanding of what motivates these people and what makes them move, especially that we are conducting business on their terms and not on our terms. Long gone are the days where products talk to consumers. 
products and brands today need to have a conversation with the consumers and with the shoppers. So you would need a big pencil case to make you basically get ahead in this line of business or in reaching out to consumers. And to be very honest, when we look at big data, small data, uh, 2.5 quintillion, was it? Okay, it's not the data that really makes people move. We're not robots, we're human beings. And we are human beings that have got emotions and that behave in a specific way. So we need to smartly look at data and couple that with a deep understanding of human behavior. And that is how we can influence behavior and change what people would want to do. If you look at shoppers at large, and the way we shop over here in either hypermarkets or in uh, shopping malls at large, freeze frame for a second, flash back, and you would see that people are herded. They look like sheep that are herded down a funnel. As a matter of fact, we need to empower these people and help move the perception from herding the shoppers into helping people shop. And that only can deliver a win-win and can deliver a better return on any investment that you do. Going back to data, we would need data that can help us better understand what people do, want, and use on their path to purchase. And we've got a proprietary piece of research that couples data with a deep understanding of how shoppers behave to answer the questions of what shoppers do, who they are to begin with, and what their needs and modes are and what influences their behavior along the path to purchase. And in there lies lots of answers. It's an, a well-informed piece of research that has been conducted since 2011 in nine countries around the world, covering more than 15 and a half thousand people quantitatively, coupled with loads of qualitative research to help us better understand how people behave as shoppers before they get into the shop, as they are in, in the shop, and after the shop. So it's the whole path to purchase journey. And based on that piece of research, I'm gonna share with you a couple of pieces of information that would open up our eyes to what the region is going. And the beauty about it is we would be able to benchmark the Middle East region represented by Saudi and the UAE versus North America and Western Europe. As we speak, as a matter of fact, People Shop is running in Moscow, it's running in Asia at this stage of time, and it's running in Australia. So we would have the opportunity to cover the world. Looking at the research, we could cluster shoppers around the world into six archetypes, what we call archetypes, uh, driven by behavior of these shoppers. Behavior, whether it is functional or emotional. And this is what you see across, I don't know, oh, this is what you see across these two axes. So you've got the thinkers, doers, feelers, and the non price sensitive and the price sensitive. If we look at the world, we can easily say that shoppers across all different categories that we have measured are equally spread around the world, the Middle East included. However, if we pull out and extract the Middle East data, which comes over here in red colored, or one of the red colored, what we see is a huge departure versus where the world is. Whereby the world is led by couponing, price sensitivity, and what have you, we notice that six out of 10 shoppers in Saudi Arabia and in the UAE are not after the cheapest price. They are after value. And there is a huge difference between value and price. And that should inform us as a piece of data, as marketers, advertisers, to stop 
the world down the price and we need to quit talking about pricing and talk about value and deliver value to our shoppers. Deliver on their expectation as adventurers, as passionate explorers. Deliver on their functional needs as quality seekers and strategic thinkers. Do not tempt them with a cheaper price because that would erode your margins and it would erode the nice competitive scene we all know of. What you actually need to do is engage and inspire your shopper. You cannot allow yourself to commoditize your product. And if you look back at all the categories that, we, that you know of as shoppers in this part of the world, they all go down the commoditized uh, alley rather than value. Let me share with you an example on how you can engage and inspire shoppers informed by data. I wouldn't claim it's big data, it's small data, but it makes a hell of a difference. In the wireless category, the retail experience has always felt like it was more about the carrier and less about the shopper. Sprint was no exception. We knew that if Sprint wanted to change people's overall perceptions of the brand, they'd need to start at retail. So we created a new Sprint experience with our Sprint customer at the center. Using proprietary research tools like our shopper segmentation study, People Shop, we looked at life through our shopper's eyes and discovered he had four key needs when shopping this complicated category. We designed the experience to meet these needs and made it easy to make the right choices. We built human stories around Sprint's products, inspiring our shoppers with solutions designed to enrich their local lives. And we put these products right in their hands. We designed new ways for Sprint employees to work side by side with shoppers instead of over a counter. We created a service and repair center to take care of their problems right there in the store. Our understanding of our shoppers' needs and wants helped us create a brand new, transparent retail experience. One that made Sprint shoppers feel confident, relaxed, and even inspired to spend more time in Sprint stores. This is the next generation of Sprint retail. Another insight I want to share with you on the shopper behavior has got to do with the functional and emotional feelings and needs of the shoppers and their moods. All of us are people who shop. You go down to the supermarket, to the hypermarket during the weekend to do your monthly shopping. And as you are driving back home at like 9.30 at night after you leave work, you just need that bottle of milk and chances are you would swing by a convenience store in a petrol station and buy it. So your moods and needs as a shopper differ greatly. Now what sort of an impact this has? It has got an impact on how brands and marketers reach out to shoppers and communicate with them and where they communicate with them. And if we look at a benchmark of the world versus the Middle East region, Saudi and the UAE one more time, we would notice that marketers are spending the bulk of the communication money, trying to talk as consumers, rather than establishing a dialogue with consumers. And in there lies the opportunity for us to actually connect and entertain the shopper, connect and entertain with the consumer, and avoid the one-way communication. And this is how we can command value to our brand. And here is a great example from uh, our U.S. operation that I would like to share with you. In 2013, we uncovered a powerful relationship between a woman's hair and the weather. When the weather was bad, her hair looked worse, and those bad hair days sent her to the drugstore for an immediate solution. So in year one, we paired Pantene with the Weather Channel at Walgreens, delivering her a geo-targeted offer based on that day's weather. But after analyzing the first year's data and performance, we learned that the real problem was not just that it was hot and humid, but the subtle weather conditions, like a misty morning, that made her hair even more unpredictable. 
And for her, the one thing worse than experiencing bad weather was being unprepared for it. She needed a way to take back control of her hair and get ahead of the weather. So for year two, we created Pantene Haircast. Pantene Haircast is a predictive service that helps her prepare for the weather and wear her hair however she wants any day of the week. We developed a dynamic digital hub within weather.com where she could get her five-day local haircast, paired with Pantene product recommendations and styling tips to arm her for even the smallest changes in the weather. And this year's program had more of everything. More products and styling solutions for more weather conditions to reach more women everywhere. Ultimately, through our targeted activation plan, we ensured that when she thought of weather, she thought of Pantene. Pantene Haircast proved to be a can't-live-without-it service, making this year's program not just her fair-weather friend, but a smarter forecast for her hair. The brand has got an intrinsic value. It's got a role to play in enhancing my life as a consumer and as a shopper. The brand cannot park at me. The brand needs to come to equal ground with me, to equal level, and engage with me. Because at the end of the day, shopping can happen anywhere. As you have seen, basically, technology helps the experience. It helps fuel the experience. Not any technology, fueled by data and knowledge. Technology can be put at the service of the brand rather than just to add glitter to what the brand does. As a matter of fact, the way we see it is we've got a huge opportunity today. An opportunity that I hope all of us would capture. It's very exciting times for all of us. We're in an industry that's driven by innovation, by technology, by engagement, and very well informed by data. Data that needs to be put to use the likes on Facebook are not data. What lies behind the likes on Facebook is the real data. It's understanding what motivates these people and what makes them move. So technology can change and will always change. At the heart of technology is what matters to people. Technology needs to be put at the service of creativity to motivate people and change their behavior. And remember, people need to be entertained, they need to be engaged, and they need to have fun. And there is a very thin line between two words, clever and smart. If we decide to go along the smart route, data is at the heart of making us smarter marketers versus clever marketers and Harvard graduate marketers. Let me share with you an example that differentiates between clever and smart. Imagine your brand created an amazing computer that transforms from a laptop to a tablet with a simple flip. But at retail, we had a problem. People wouldn't even touch it because they were afraid they'd break it. So how do you solve this flipping problem? By making it irresistible for people to not just touch the device, but to pick it up and experience it. We teamed up with Grammy Award winning artist Neo, poised to release his new album, Nonfiction. What's going on guys? My name is Neo and I'm about to perform my next song, but here's the thing. I'm putting tonight's gig in your hands, right? With the help of a video shoot, 3D soundstage, a digital audience, and a custom built 4K display, we turned an exclusive single into an interactive concert experience. And with the two and one at their fingertips, shoppers could put themselves in the middle of it and make it all their own. See these two and ones? It tells us we load them up with everything we need to make sure this show is great. We launched the experience of 50 tech retail stores, inviting shoppers across the country to get inside Neo's performance. The software was purpose-built to make flipping irresistible. Shoppers could DJ the concert with full control of mixing the music, or with a flip, they could create their very own light show with everything from lasers and spotlights to fog and confetti. And here's where it really got fun. Custom program artificial intelligence let Neo react in real time to a shopper's mix. For better. Now that's the kind of beat I'm talking about. Or worse. All right, come on now. You got to help me out a little more than that. 
Roberts could instantly release their mix and light show to the world. And Neil picked his favorites, tweeting them to his millions of fans, driving online participation that leads people right back to the store. By immersing shoppers in this in-store experience, we have gone from seeing people afraid to touch our two-in-ones to having thousands of people each week who can't take their hands off them. Technology is not the answer to everything. Remember, technology needs to be put at the service of the brand rather than to add this to the brand. And here's an example where technology fails. Emma. Huh? Emma. Emma. Emma? <laughs> so my invitation to all of you is to be smart. I know you are clever, just be smart. So thank you very much and thanks. Uh,